Welcome to On Contact. Today we discuss the importance of third parties in the upcoming presidential election with Howie Hawkins. I'm worried about climate change. Nukes are on hair trigger alert. Um, we're getting into a new nuclear arms race. Obama approved a trillion dollar modernization. Right. Now we pulled out of the Intermediate right, Nuclear right. Force Treaty. You know, the, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists have their, you know, doomsday clock at two minutes to midnight. That's as high as it's ever been. Um, so I worry that too many progressive-minded people are going to settle for someone who's status quo, Democrat. Perhaps there is no better illustration of the importance of third parties than the Green New Deal. It was not the progressive wing of the Democratic Party led by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who first proposed this project. It was articulated 12 years ago by the Green Party, which called for a massive jobs and public works program to transition our energy infrastructure to renewable energy. The deal was promoted by Howie Hawkins when he ran for the governorship of New York in 2014 and by Jill Stein during her 2016 presidential run. The proposal for a Green New Deal by the Green Party, however, has a fundamental difference from that being touted by progressive Democrats. It does not argue that structural change and a transition to renewable energy will come by making alliances with corporate power. Unless we bring about a transformational change in our economy by overthrowing corporate power and establishing a socialist system, all efforts to create a Green New Deal, as well as roll back the abuses of corporate power, will be stillborn. Joining me to discuss the Green New Deal and the importance of the Green Party in the upcoming presidential race is Howie Hawkins, who has formed an exploratory committee to see if he should run as the Green Party's presidential candidate. And I hope you do. Uh, so let's talk, because there's going to be a lot of pressure in 2020, uh, uh, even more pressure than the past, uh, that you know, we just have to get rid of Trump. Everything has become personalized in Donald Trump, uh, and once he disappears, we'll magically restore uh, our democracy, except, of course, we won't. Um, so talk about that. What, what do you say to people who say, we, I can't vote third party? Because the Democrats don't have real solutions. Trump is a racist scapegoater. He's a freeloading leech, doesn't pay his own employees, contracts, taxes. Um, and he lies to the people. I mean, he needs to go. But you replace them with Democrats, they're not going to enact Medicare for all. They're not going to do a Green New Deal. They are backing Trump, who now wants a war for oil in Venezuela while the planet is burning for burning oil. I mean, it's madness. So the point of having a Green Party, and we're fighting for our existence. I mean, getting on the ballot in this country compared to other electoral democracies around the world is a real battle. And uh, so that's one purpose of the campaign, just to exist and be able to present these things. The historic role of third parties in this country has been to raise issues the major parties won't take up, like the Liberty Party and the question of slavery. They were the abolitionists when the Whigs and the Democrats didn't want to touch the issue. And we can go for 150 years of history and show how that's the case. Well, that Roosevelt's New Deal came out of the Progressive Party, and he didn't think it up. But he, he as the kind of the liberal wing of the oligarchic elite, realized with the breakdown of capitalism uh, that in the same way you see the Democrats appropriating the Green New Deal, except asking corporations to do it. This is a classic example of the importance of third parties throughout our history. And yet, there's probably never been a harder time in American history in which to mount third parties because of the collusion of the Democratic and Republican elites, who since Ross Perot, as you point out, and I work for Nader, make it almost impossible even to get on the ballot, much less get to the debates. Or get covered by the mass media, uh, which is how you get the word out. Yeah, that's become a bigger, bigger problem. Um, you used to be able to get print media, go town to town, but the newspapers are dying. So that's very difficult. You can go on social media, but that's a swamp. It's, I mean, you get drowned out. I remember in the 60s, Paul Goodman complaining about how you could put out a nice op-ed, but you get drowned out with all the you know, garbage in the, in the media. So that's always been a tough problem. But uh, now, like, now they formed a commission here in New York State 
it takes 50,000 running for governor to get a ballot line. I did that three times running for the Green Party. And you got what, 5% was it? I, I got a 5%. Yeah. That was in 2014. And, you know, Governor Cuomo responded by uh, going with a ban on fracking. Uh, movement toward $15 minimum wage and tuition-free college and paid family leave, which were top issues in our campaign. So he had to respond. That 5% leveraged some issues. On the other hand, go back to the New Deal. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt once told Norman Thomas, the socialist standard bearer in that time, uh, what do you think? I carried out your program. And Thomas replied, yeah, on a stretcher. Yeah. And that's the problem with what we're getting with the Green New Deal when it gets in the Democratic hands. Or Bernie Sanders calls himself a socialist when he's really a New Deal liberal. He explicitly says we don't want uh, social ownership of the major means of production, which is how you have economic democracy. And just take the energy question. We are not going to get to 100% clean energy if Exxon gets to reinvest its earnings in more oil exploration, extraction, and sales. And the Koch brothers and all their interests in the oil industries. Those should be publicly owned. And then we take the earnings, because we'll use fossil fuels in the transition, but reinvest them in renewables. So that is a socialist solution. You can get programs of social provision, like Social Security is one of the New Deal programs, like Medicare for All, which Bernie Sanders champions. But as long as the capitalist oligarchy has their power based on their concentrated ownership of the economy, that translates into political power, they can roll it back. They can take Dennis Kucinich, the boy mayor of Cleveland. He was elected on a promise not to privatize the municipal utility which the suburban utility wanted to do. And he kept his promise. So the bank said, OK, we're not going to roll over your line of credit. Now, every city needs a line of credit because the taxes come in in bunches, and you've got to pay, make payroll every week. So they bankrupted the city and forced Kucinich out. That's the kind of private power that if you don't deal with, your reform program is not going to hold. What's interesting about Sanders, and has been my long criticism of Sanders, is that he won't attack the military-industrial complex. Um, and you can't build a socialist country when over half of your discretionary spending is being funneled into useless wars and the military. And I, I just want to, before we go into this, you're a Marine Corps veteran and come out of the working class here. You, although somehow you went to Dartmouth, I don't know how that happened. But uh, sports r was it sports? Sports, <laughs> yeah. A, a dirty secret. I, I also went to college for sports. I, I thought they were accepting me as a dangerous intellectual. But anyway, go ahead. Um, uh, Talk about that, the, that, because any serious reconfiguration of power has to confront the unchecked and rampant militarism, which Bernie won't touch. Yeah, and waste, fraud, and abuse, $23 trillion unaccounted for in this recent audit that actually Sanders helped get. Um, now, I don't think all that money was stolen. It's a lot of incompetence. Um, and that is an enormous drain, not just on... Uh, the operating budget of the government, but we have put all of our human capital, engineers and scientists, yeah. into developing weapons of mass destruction instead of clean energy technology. Now, we got the technology for that, but our manufacturing base in this country, it didn't go away just because of cheap labor markets abroad, which we encourage, and the maquiladores in Mexico or in China. Uh, Japan and Germany have high-wage competitive manufacturing because they've kept their technology up. We have not done that. So when I talk about a Green New Deal, I'm talking about an economic bill of rights, like Roosevelt called for at the end of his you know, 1944 State of the Union address, asked Congress to enact a job, income, health care, housing, and education, primary rights. And then the Civil Rights Movement picked that up with the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, the Freedom Budget, and the Poor People's Campaign. And we still don't have it. Um, so that's part of it. But the other part is, 100% clean energy by 2030. But to do that, we've got to reorganize all the sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, the military, um, transportation, uh, for sustainability, or we'll never get to 100% well, clean energy. And let's be energy. clear that if we don't, and we don't do it quickly, the human species is going to suffer a massive die-off, if not go extinct. That's the existential crisis that we face. Right. We face it from global warming. We face it from... Uh, the overuse, well, the maximum use of pesticides, which is killing off yep. the insects. And that's an important part of the food pyramid. And if you don't have insects, you don't have agriculture. Well, you don't have I agriculture. just had Vandana Shiva on here who addresses that issue. And if people haven't watched it, they should. One of the things that, ha having been close to Ralph and worked with third parties since Ralph ran in 2000, 
is that the positions that are taken by the Green Party are in fact, in almost all cases, majoritarian positions. I just want to read a few off. Sure. The economy. 82% of Americans think wealthy people have too much power and influence. 69% think large businesses have too much power and influence in Washington. 78% of likely voters support stronger rules and enforcement regulation of the financial industry. 48% of Americans think economic inequality is very big or moderately big, 34%. 59% of registered voters and 51% of registered Republicans favor raising the minimum amount that low wage workers can make and still be eligible for the earned income tax credit from 14,820 to 18,000. 96% of Americans, including 96% of Republicans, believe money in politics is to blame for the dysfunction of the American system. 76% believe wealthy Americans should pay higher taxes. 59% favor raising the federal minimum wage to at least $12 an hour. 61%, including 42% of Republicans, this surprised me, approve of labor unions. 60% of Americans believe it is the federal government's responsibility to make sure all Americans have health care. And 60% of registered voters favor expanding Medicare to provide health insurance to every single citizen. 59% favor free early childhood education. 76% are concerned about climate disruption. 84% support requiring background checks for all gun owners. 58% of Americans believe that abortion should be legal and all. And yet, from both of the parties, none, almost none, except for maybe abortion, none of these majoritarian issues are being addressed. And that's the problem of American politics. Public preferences don't translate into public policy because the political system responds to the donors, not the voters. And that's why it's important that the Greens be out there. And the first thing we got to do is get on the ballot. I mean, we have 51 state ballots counting D.C., and we're on about 20 now, uh, but that leaves the other 31. And we've, you know, done a rough estimate. We need about 800,000 signatures and uh, a million and a half dollars just to have some coordinators for the volunteers out there to get all those signatures. Big job, and uh, we're just fighting to get into the election. Then you fight to get in, and then you fight to get heard. But in most countries, you just have a reasonable, you know, requirement to just show you're not frivolous, and then you're in. Well, but and in, that's the, way in it the American system, if you don't have literally hundreds of millions of dollars, you can't advertise you, you, because these uh, television stations, CNN, that this is where they're making all their money from, uh, and. Because the debate commission is a private corporation, which a lot of people don't know, um, you're locked out. Yeah. And uh, the media won't take you seriously unless you got those hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, if you watch they, in the they, media when they report, even now, it's Bernie Sanders has raised this amount. All of your credibility, it, it, by, implicitly, by the media is how much money you've got. Yeah. But Bernie Sanders' example is what the left, the Greens, have to do. Lots of people giving right. a little bit. We can, we can do that. That's historically what the labor movement, the socialist movement, has done. The party started from the top down. There were elite caucuses. The working class couldn't vote. We're going to come back to that. Okay. When we come back, we will continue our conversation about third parties with Howie Hawkins. <laughs> as never before. Veins of information twisting every way. Let me untangle these countless threads. Just press play. founded by three young Americans who love their country, but we have to constantly question our government. Watching the Hawks brings you the stories that give voice to the voiceless. 
We dig a little deeper. We hit the stories that everyone else is afraid to touch, is afraid to talk about because they don't want to upset their corporate sponsors or interrupt their government access. Now is the time, more than ever, that we need to question more. We're in this post-truth world where, where words have to matter again. It's about educating people and giving them context instead of telling them what to think. Dialogue is far more valuable than debate. There comes a time when you just have to say, you know what? Enough is enough, damn it. The most important thing that we do, be transparent, be fair, be honest. The time says we're not, they're wrong. We are only covering the 5G story because Russian President Vladimir Putin told us to do so. New York Times, our invitation stands. Come visit our show, meet our staff, we don't bite, be our guest. Welcome back to On Contact. We continue our conversation about third parties with Howie Hawkins. So what's the strategy in the Trump era for a third party like the Green Party? Well, we get on a ballot and we run for president and you can secure ballots for the next election cycle. Depends on the state. One, two, three, five percent. Depends on the state. Alabama's 20 percent. That's really tough. Uh, in some cases, it's not the presidential candidate, it's another statewide candidate, but the presidential candidate can have the coattails. So we can have an influence on getting ballot lines for nearly 40 states. And then we got to go back to the local districts and start electing people to city councils and county legislatures and district seats for state legislatures and Congress and build this from the bottom up. Uh, we don't need all that money if we got a strong organization and energy to win local races. And uh, that gives us credibility. So we won't have a presidential candidate who is taken seriously by the mass media and the public until we got a caucus in Congress. The purpose of this campaign is to get those ballot lines and follow up in the next few years and elect a lot of people. And, you know, I've been patient. I've been involved in uh, the movement, as we called it, in oh, the 60s. Oh, you were one of the founders of the Green Party, I believe. Yeah, right? well, I, I supported Peace and Freedom Party and the People's Party and the Citizens Party. Before that, I, got, I was at the first meeting of the Green Party in 84 and have been involved ever since. But for me, this goes way back because when I was coming up, I saw Ronald Reagan running around California to repeal the Rumford Fair Housing Law that had just passed by referendum. The Republicans got it done, looked at the Democrats. They sat the segregationist Dixiecrats from Mississippi instead of the integrated Mississippi Freedom De Democratic delegation. And I'm 12 years old asking, where's my party? And uh, later learned John Lewis had asked that question in his speech <laughs> the year before. But in any case, my party was the Peace and Freedom Party. And uh, I haven't seen those parties. I mean, to me, I entered adulthood. I was drafted for a war. The Democrats started and the Republicans this supported. Vietnam. Yeah. And as I left, bipartisan cuts to pensions of multi-employer pension funds. So my pension was cut 20 percent right before I retired. So the two parties, you know, and I think that's been the experience of a lot of people. So we need an alternative. And uh, the difference now is I was an angry young man. I'm even angrier now because they're destroying the planet and yeah. we're running out of time and we just can't mess around. And uh, like I said, the Democrats aren't going to enact what we need. Uh, we want to put a Green New Deal out there that's the standard. Uh, you know, good on uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the Sunshine Movement for putting it on the agenda, the Green New Deal. You know, we've been campaigning in New York for that since 2010, but uh, now it's everybody talking about it, and the presidential candidate's got to talk about it. We're going to put out a Green New Deal. We're going to have the prices, the budget, and it's going to be the standard. It's, you know, 100 percent clean energy by 2030, the Economic Bill of Rights, and how are we going to transform all the other production sectors so that... Uh, we have a sustainable society. And uh, so if I run, that's, you know, what I'll be putting out You're going to get hit with a couple things. Uh, one criticism, which I think has some merit to it, is that uh, when the Green Party feels a presidential candidate, it's kind of top down. Um, that there isn't, and you talked about the importance of electing, but it, it, it does have the feel that it's not bottom up often. And there's a great disparity between the viability of state green parties having addressed a few of them. Some of them 
are just kind of social clubs, largely for older white men. Can you talk about that? Yeah, one of the purposes of the campaign that we've talked about, if I declare, is that we will hire organizers and teach people from the traditions of community organizing and union organizing, as well as electoral campaigning. How do you broaden your base? How do you go talk to people? How do you go out and listen? How do you, you know, one of my favorite examples, because I witnessed this coming up, was the Black Panther Party set up a storefront. And they had their little 10-point program that Huey Newton and Bobby Seale put together. And, uh, but things like sickle cell anemia, breakfast program, uh, escorting seniors when they got their paycheck, you know, from the bank to the grocery store so they didn't get mugged. That was people coming into the storefront and saying, I got a problem, can you help right. me? And that's, so that's one of the techniques of organizing. You don't just go out and tell people what they're supposed to do. You go out and listen and see what their problems are. And, what they, and then you help them do it. And once you build a relationship, now then you can ask them, can you help me do that? Let this? me just interject. You will never build that relationship electronically. That's a relationship like me, this. Yes, absolutely. I so agree with that. And that's a problem we've got. Everybody's in their little silo and they're waiting for move on to tell them the next thing they're supposed to do. And they didn't talk to anybody about that. Some staff at move on did. Right. And so we are learning or losing the ability to think for ourselves, argue respectfully, you know, have real disagreements and learn from each other and work it out. Um, now it's... Uh, you, you find out something's happening and you join it. I mean, one of the things I tell Greens is our people are very reliable activists. They show up at the demonstrations. They lobby when we ask for lobbying. You know, and it's a lot of all the movements. We're there, but we don't organize. We don't initiate stuff. We don't bring new people in by, you know, some of these techniques of organizing as we build unions or community organizations. We want to, in the campaign, devote a lot of resources to that. We're not going to out TV ads, you know, to major parties. Um, and, you know, we can have a field operation, but really we want to, where we find people that really want to organize, we want to help them do it and pass on, you know, what organizers have learned. We want to move from mobilizing to organizing. And I should be clear, you were a labor organizer. Well, I, I rank and file. I was never a paid staffer. I, you know, worked at uh, UPS. But a union. Yeah, yeah. And I've been involved in a lot of labor campaigns, you know, whether it was my union or others, you know, going back to the great boycott and... You know, J.P. Stevens and the Marinci Miners, you know, and I've worked with, you know, people come from the AFL. I must be on a list down there because when they come to Syracuse, sometimes they call me, you know, how do we deal with this or that problem? So, yeah, I have that experience. And uh, I think we need more people like that. You know, the organizers tend to be paid staffers. And that, you know, as Malcolm told the NACP, he said, you don't... Uh, your dues are too low, and so you got to go to the white liberals for money, and then they tell you what you can and can't right, do. Right. So he was, that was King's problem too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Malcolm said we're going to we're going to raise the money ourselves, so we have political independence, um, and that's what our movements need to do. Because right now, the nonprofit industrial complex, you look behind who's yeah. funding it; it's billionaires. Sure, the Sierra Club, everything else. That's right. Yeah, move yeah. On, move on, move on, sabotage single payer, single handedly. Uh, but, and uh, told everyone to support Obamacare. Yeah, and then the public option was a, like yeah. a very clever way to uh, say you can have partial single payer. It's right, a right, step right, toward right, it. Right, right. Oh yeah. You are going to get hit, and I'm still hit with it for uh, working for Ralph in his presidential runs. And I had someone. I gave a talk a week or two ago, and somebody even shouted it out. Uh, you gave us uh, George W. Bush. You, you, this is going to be a powerful argument that the Democrats are going to use and say, oh, you want vote green is a vote for Trump. What do you say to that? Well, no, a vote for green is a vote for green. The Democrats don't represent us. We want Medicare for all. I really doubt the Democrats. It, it was on their platform from, like you used to call it, national health insurance from 1946 till Clinton got the nomination in 92. They didn't get it done even though there were Democratic majorities in Congress with a Democratic president, every president uh, that was a Democrat. So they don't represent us, and we have a right to put our uh, view forward. If you're worried about the spoiler problem, the splitting the vote problem, we've given you the answer, Democrats. It's called ranked choice voting for single seats, proportional representation in legislative bodies. Uh, you know, the Electoral College, you've lost two elections because of the uh, inanities of the Electoral College, and 
now that another election is coming up, a couple people have raised it who are presidential candidates. I remember right after Bush uh, got anointed by the Supreme Court. That's right. Let's be clear on that, because it was an overturning of all legal precedent led by Sandra Day O'Connor, who thought George W. was his father. Uh, there was no legal precedent for that. So they stopped the counting in Florida. Every, that's the fact. Right. And, and when the media went back and counted every which way, hanging chads or not, Gore won the state. Yeah. So, yeah, in the end, it was the Supreme Court, not the Green Party. That's right. And, uh, you, I mean, there are 100 arguments you can make to, you know, to pick on Ralph Nader. I mean, David McReynolds, the socialist candidate, said, used to say, why does he get all the credit? I got more <laughs> votes in the margin myself. And uh, so, yeah, it's really ridiculous. It's an excuse, not an analysis. What worries you the most about the political season we're headed towards? Trump clearly incites violence. He is a racist. He is a demagogue. He has very open anti-democratic sentiments. Um, I mean, potentially, especially if there is an economic downturn, which there is coming eventually, what worries you? Uh, well, I'm worried about climate change. Nukes are on hair trigger alert. Um, we're getting into a new nuclear arms race. Obama approved a trillion dollar modernization. Now we've pulled out of the Intermediate right, Nuclear right. Force Treaty. You know, the, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists have their, you know, doomsday clock at two minutes to midnight. That's as high as it's ever been. Um, so I worry that too many progressive minded people are going to settle for someone who's status quo, Democrat. Um, now, you know, the Green Party probably won't win, win the presidency, but the bigger vote we get, the more leverage we'll have in the debate going forward, and more credibility our local candidates will have. So, you know, that vote, it means a lot, and I think people need to vote for what they want and make the politicians but it, come to them. it's more important than that, because I don't believe the Democratic Party is reformable, and I suspect you don't either. Oh, yeah, I, no. I mean, I've been watching it my whole life. And uh, that's, as we say, where movements go to die. And uh, they're good at it. Well, they're good at they're good at they're good at sucking in people into that black hole. Yeah, between co-opting some people who are activists with careers, and the other people with rhetoric. I mean, even Andrew Cuomo's got a Green New Deal now, which is just a cover for right. flooding the state with frac gas power plants, subsidizing nuclear power, and oh by the way, we're doing some offshore wind. It's not a solution to the climate problem, but Green New Deal got popular, so he said, yeah, I got a Green New Deal, too. Well, it's like BP running ads about how they protect the environment, and they've created one of the largest dead zones in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, and those ads said, where BP stands for Beyond Petroleum, right. which, I mean, was such a blatant lie. They're, right, a, right, right. they're an oil company. That's kind of the Democratic Party, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I mean, is it that, I mean, they will co-opt the language. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm concerned that people like AOC, Bernie Sanders, make them look better than they well, are. Well, of course, that's why they let them run. But they'll never allow Bernie. I can't believe they'll allow... I can't believe Bernie's running again, as Samuel Johnson said, the triumph of hope over experience. Well, I think the question is... I think the, the base likes him. He could win. Yeah, he could. Then the question is, does the establishment treat him like they did McGovern or like they did Roosevelt? Because Trump is so unpredictable, a lot of the establishment says... This guy's bad for the stock market. He's bad for peace, which is good for the economy. We don't know what this guy's going to do. They don't might go. prefer a reformist Sanders in there to a crazy Trump. I don't but know what be, they're going to do. He'd be paralyzed if he got in. I can't believe... He'd be you. contained, yeah, I don't the think they'll, he'll get the nomination. I don't, you know, I don't think uh, Wall Street... I mean, they didn't even like Obama. And Obama was, as Cornell West said, a mascot of Wall Street. Yeah, but in the primaries, the voters had a final say. You know, yeah. they didn't want McGovern. Yeah. The Republicans didn't want Trump. They established Well, them. then they fixed the rules after McGovern. Remember that? They fixed yep, those rules? Yep. McGovern opened up the rules. He won, and they started closing and them they back down. They closed them back down. Right. So, well, I wish you all the best. Uh, you definitely, if you run, you got my vote. All right. Thank you. That was Green Party presidential hopeful, Howie Hawkins.